Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining Double Radius today for our webinar with IgniteNet on high capacity solutions. My name is Chad Crossland. I'm the marketing manager here at Double Radius. Our speaker for today is Dan Kazwara. He is the field application engineer at IgniteNet. And joining him is also Tony Stramandinoli. He's the VP of sales at IgniteNet. And we've also got our very own Ken Morrison who'll be uh, watching our Q&A and be reading those questions out loud so everyone can uh, hear them towards the end in our Q&A time. Um, just a couple housekeeping items before we kick off. Uh, throughout the webinar, please do enter any questions that you have into the questions box that will allow uh, Ken to get those organized and again, read those out loud at the end so everyone can have the benefit of hearing the questions uh, before they get answered. And then uh, just after the webinar is done, if you could take a brief moment to complete the survey that will appear on your screen, that would be wonderful. We'd appreciate that very much. And with that, let's jump right in. I'm gonna hand it over now to Dan to get us started. Awesome, thank you, Chad. Um, welcome everybody and appreciate you taking your time out of your day to listen to what IgniteNet has. So uh, without any delay, let me start. First talk about um, IgniteNet's products are all either standalone or can be cloud managed. So we have a cloud, so cloud.ignitenet.com uh, gets you there. It's, uh, you could log on and create an account for free. Actually, the, uh, the first two devices, let me skip along here, um, are free. And if you have more than that, it's actually just $99 a year for an unlimited amount of devices. The, um, there's the indoor and outdoor Wi-Fi. There's the 60 gigahertz product that IgniteNet's well known for. Um, wired access, the switches. And then there's also uh, add-on apps and services. And of course, as it being managed by the cloud, you could access it anywhere at any time, the big advantage of cloud. But to also point out just that the devices don't have to be managed by cloud. A lot of it, a lot of people just set it up as standalone and you can do that. Um, one thing I really like about IgniteNet's products is that you could initially set it up standalone when you first configure them and set them up, and then later add them into the cloud without losing the configuration. You could limit the configuration to be still um, not transferred to the cloud. You could still see it and manage it and view it and have access to um, whether it's up and down and, and uh, from a management perspective, it's like more monitoring, but the configuration doesn't have to be lost. Uh, another thing with the cloud I've found is that it's very easy to use. A lot of manufacturers uh, claim that their clouds are simple and easy to use. Well, I think you'll find that actually that's true with IgniteNet's cloud. It actually really is easy to use. As with clouds, you have the, the typical alerts you could set. Uh, so if a device goes down, you could set email notifications, especially for like links that are important. You want to know about those. You could certainly set, set those up. Things you typically expect within cloud management. Uh, it has uh, full network visibility. You, you look at live statistical info and active client info and historical info. That's useful for troubleshooting, uh, especially uh, client devices connecting and looking at their signal strength uh, and what they're doing, what kind of download and upload, say a particular device is doing, a specific MAC address or device. You can see if they're uh, unusual uh, usage on the network, if there's excessive downloads and tying up the network resources, you can see that very clearly. This slide's showing that the cloud is intuitive. The cloud level, your account, you have sites, and then you have devices that are within the sites, which makes logical sense. So it's like, like I said earlier, it's easy to use. Um, here's just a, a view of the, uh, the dashboard of the cloud showing uh, from a high level uh, view uh, devices. These are the total uh, devices. Say. So if there's something, you definitely want to pay attention to one, say if something's offline, you can see it very clearly. Um, and also the activity, if there's changes, a firmware update or uh, or rebooted, you can look at the activity of all, all the devices and you can look at, look at what's going on on, the, on your total 
uh, from everything, or you could do it down to you know specific sites. This is uh, the site level dashboard. So you can see now we're down to a specific site. And now we're down to the device itself. So this device has, in this example, an access point, has quiet radios connected. And you could look at them. And especially, this is really nice for troubleshooting. Look at the RSSI size of the, of the devices connected to the access point. If there's something really weak, like negative 80, you know that there's a problem is why is that client device so weak? Um, is it because there's a coverage hole or is there a problem with the roaming? You know, for example, that'd be a useful way of troubleshooting that. The cloud allows you to use Google Maps. So especially for like this, if you're doing a point to point link or something, you could just use Google Maps or if you're doing indoor deployments, you could uh, load in a, a file, uh, a floor plan, and then you drag and drop where you'd want to place your your access points feature. Uh, it's very useful for troubleshooting again. So if somebody says, hey, uh, down here in the, the first floor uh, hallway, um, there's no coverage or there's a problem. Well, then you can go to the cloud and go directly to that particular access point and know without worrying about which particular one it was on the network, because that would be kind of hard to figure out. Um, you can go to the map and see which one it is and then drill down and, and troubleshoot accordingly. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about a little about the product line. So IgniteNet has um, indoor and outdoor access points, AC Wave 2. Um, the Spark 1200 is a Wave 2. The, uh, it's a 2x2. Two two. Um, one of the things I think, uh, I think a takeaway from this is that it gets overlooked is, is that it's, it's an it's a indoor-outdoor access point. It's actually outdoor. It's capable of being outdoor. I think it's, it's, it's price point is pretty respective of an indoor, but it's IP55. So uh, what that could be useful for is say, for example, like in hotels or hall, you know, things where you have, let's say, an outdoor, uh, under, um, a roof or something, uh, a, a walkway or something, uh, that would be a, an option you can do where you can't really do that with indoor access points. Another thing, because it's outdoor capable, it has an option for bridge mode. So you could potentially use the five acre side to bridge. And because it's outdoor radio, you could put it in a strategic location, excuse me, for let's say if there's a problem with coverage, you at least use that 2.4 to get you that last bit of coverage where there potentially would be a, a dead zone, but running cable would just be such a, such a hassle. Also has pretty good output power. It's a 23 dBm on both 2.4 and 5 watts. So uh, pretty, pretty high power output as well. The next one is the, the Wave 2 Mini. So the Mini is really small. It's actually about three and a half by three and a half inches. It's a, even though it's very small in form factor, it's pretty powerful. It is a, a, a two by two. Uh, so even though it's small, it's still two by two radio, uh, both 2.4 and five gigahertz, so dual band. And what I thought was pretty surprising when I first saw this was the, uh, the high output power. It's up to 25 dBm on 2.4 and 22 on five gigahertz. So very small form factor, but pretty high output power and also two by two and dual band and wave two. This is the, the same one, but just PoE. So for a little more, you have the option to have PoE power to, to power them. This is a more popular model because it's P, it can be powered by PoE. So off of the switch port and it's just low power. It's a, in other words, it's a, an a, 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 a um, pulls about five watts. So it's, it's not a high powered unit. You could run off a normal uh, a standard PoE switch. Um, and uh, everything else pretty much the same as the mini, the, the previous mini, except the PoE. The next one, the four by four. So this one's the, the, the big boy, the quad core CPU, four by four. So this is high capacity, high user uh, count, a lot of devices. So in, a, in an area where there's a lot of uh, users, this is where you'd want the, the extra horsepower uh, of both the fact that it's a four by four, but also the, the, the processing capability. It does require, because it's actually four by four, so um, it actually has eight total radios in it. So it's AT powered, it pulls 24 watts. So it's, it's, uh, it's pretty powerful. 
here's the, just a product overview of what we discussed. Uh, another thing I want to point out is the, uh, the antenna gains. So I mentioned that the output power is pretty high, uh, but also um, even with the minis, you see four and five dBi. And then the, 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 uh, the 1200 and 2600s are six and eight dBi, so very high gain antennas along with the higher output power. So uh, you could definitely get some pretty good coverage out of these. Gigahertz radio is special because that's the, the failover radio. So unlike maybe some other uh, competitors, it's, it's, dual, it's a dual radio device. So if the 60 does go down, you have the five gigahertz uh, backup. Okay, so I'm just gonna go over a little bit of 60 gigahertz. 60 gigahertz is an interesting band. Uh, it originally um, it was considered the V band. It's from 40 to 75 gigahertz. It's also termed as the millimeter, millimeter wave. Um, originally it was 57 to 60 gigahertz unlicensed, and now it's been expanded up to 71 gigahertz. So we actually have 14 gigahertz available to us, at least in the US. Um, now, um, it, there's no restriction on whether or not it's point to point or point to multi point. And I think the big takeaway uh, for one thing is that 60 gigahertz is unlicensed. So it's just like 2.4 and 5, it's another tool in the, tool in the bag, if you will, options of, of choices you have to provide a solution for what you're trying to accomplish. So speaking of which, why go 60? What's uh, things that I think because of the uh, extremely high, well, okay. There, in 60, the channel widths are really wide, which really means you have a lot of available throughput. That's the big thing you'll see um, mm -hmm. over a gigabit easily because they're just, the channel widths are so wide. They're actually two gigahertz wide. Um, so it's a true alternative to fiber. Um, so unlike laying fiber, you have an immediate uh, deployment and your ROI is right there. You don't have to worry about the delays of zoning costs. And you're, let's say, you're eventually going to run fiber. You can temporarily put some stuff, or you could have it as a, let's say, a form of redundancy potentially. Um, and also, 60 gigahertz compared to other bands, it uh, gets you away from, say, 5 gigahertz. I know a lot of uh, users are now replacing their five gigahertz. So they're freeing up their five gigahertz for other stuff because five gigahertz is a limited frequency space. You're, you're just having an alternative moving it over to 60. So now you're freeing up some five. Okay, so here's a slide showing 60 compared to two, 24 gigahertz and five gigahertz. So yeah, they're all unlicensed. Um, the interference probability is the big difference I think that you uh, want to see, and also the, the range. The range is less, um, but that what seemingly would be considered a negative, nece not necessarily is. When you have less range, you also have less interference, or the chance of, uh, in a sense, even your own network interference on yourself. Um, the range is up to about two or three kilometers typically. You can't hear anything further than that either. You're not going to get interference from further further radios uh, on the same frequency. You can, the channel reuse becomes much easier. Uh, also available spectrum is actually now 14, that slide, it's actually 14,000 megahertz. So there's so much free, there's so much available frequency space. That's not an issue. Actually, um, which I have, I'll discuss a little bit of, um, uh, we're working on actually um, having firmware that uh, will actually use a narrower channel and get us a little more range, a little more link reliability. Okay, here, so I mentioned frequencies here. So I'm more going to talk about the U.S., uh, Canada, and Mexico, our, our here in the U.S., 64 to 71, so, um, or actually 50, I'm sorry, 57 to 71 gigahertz. So the channels, you'll see um, the IgniteNet products have a channel one, two, three, and four. Uh, so starting at 57 and going across up to 64 gigahertz. Uh, now, uh, that's, one thing to point out is that um, the, which I haven't brought up yet, is the big um, the grill in the room is the the oxygen absorption gigahertz. So there's a couple things to consider at 60 gigahertz. One is that, um, or is that there's oxygen loss. The signal 
say at channel two, you get 15 dB of attenuation uh, per kilometer. That's a lot. Um, at channel four, it's uh, nine dB. Um, you also have to factor in rain phase. So those are two uh, considerations. And that's what kind of limits your range to typically about up to about two, two kilometers or so. Um, most of the links, our products you'll see in our product literature uh, are recommended up to about a mile further, but uh, you know, your link reliability could go down a little bit, but, but realize you do have the five gigahertz failover radio built in. So a lot of people choose that. And it's not like the five gigahertz radio is a slouch. I mean, you still have a couple hundred megabits uh, when you fail over the five. So it's not like it's crawling slow. It's just not that gigabit plus that you may see on the 60 gigahertz side. If you look at the channel, they're actually 2.16 gigahertz apart. That's how wide they are. Okay, I mentioned earlier about how um, gigahertz doesn't really get interference or, or cause interference actually. So uh, not only because of its short range and gets absorbed pretty quick, quickly, uh, it's, it's also uh, the antennas you're using, especially for the point to point, um, on the client side is, or point to multipoint, is they're very directional. Uh, you'll see on our 35 centimeter product, it's a one degree beam width. And the 19 centimeter is a 36 dBi antenna, is three degrees, so very narrow. So that means it's uh, receiving that narrow, you know, bandwidth as well. The connections are Layer two uh, transparent bridging. So any and all settings on the network side, it's uh, virtually invisible. It's, invis it's like an invisible wire. You know, typical you'd see within bridging, but it's transparent. So any settings and uh, VLANs or anything you have or are set on one side should carry over to the other side. Uh, point to multipoint. So I want to point that out, uh, which I'll discuss. Uh, is you'll you'll get um, yeah, we have sector antennas uh, to get still maintain a decent amount of range, even though you're losing range by going point to multipoint. We have 120 degree sector antenna, or, or I should say access points for, for that type of application. I'll discuss that more later. Uh, for those farther links, uh, say like a kilometer, uh, and you're doing both, both sides with very directional, say the one degree or three degree products, uh, you you um, may need a little bit of assistance there because it's very directional. Um, so we have an alignment scope that there's a boss on the top of the radio that um, alignment scope on top to help you uh, help align the antenna. Um, or you could uh, there's a USB port on them as well, so you could plug in a dongle. We have an optional dongle, uh, and then you run your app on your phone. It could be a, a Android or Apple device and it could look at the signal strength there, or you just as you, or you could have the option to log into the GUI. Either way, uh, to zone in on getting the signal. We recommend uh, for the shorter links, it's easier. But further, you may want to first connect on five and get it zoned in there, and then switch over to sixty and and, and get it dialed in that way. There's just an overview of the uh, the GUI of the the radio. Uh, you'll see the they're showing an example there with the 60 gigahertz link, the 60 gigahertz radio in use. Um, you see it in the slide, it says disabled, but you could have that as your backup radio. And if it's connected, if it's set up as a backup radio, it actually maintains the link at the same time on five gigahertz at the same time, but not in use until until there's an interruption in the, um, in the connection on 60, but it maintains it. Um, so for a very time typically less than 10 milliseconds so that's good and that's the ideal uh, configuration is to have the five gigahertz uh, set up as a backup you could manage or set it up via uh, the local web GUI or the cloud or SNMP for monitoring if you need MIB files you could contact us for that um, also, I want to point out, okay, this is good, the link path. So on the cloud, which is a free account, you could log in and create an account. For, uh, you could do link path. Link path is free. You go on there and you could create a simulated, this is a link budget calculator, 
uh, for 60 gigahertz. So um, with products there, like our product, the master, say the, the uh, Metrolink 60, the 35 centimeter, that's the 42 dBi one. Um, and then let's say if you're using the beam forming, the 18 dBi antenna and which channel I'm using and assuming a certain amount of uh, rain fade and then the distance, um, you could then calculate the expected RSSI. And then it actually go further and tell you your expected kind of data rates too, but those are data rates and throughput. It, it does give that to you, um, what like a prediction of it, but I like using it because then uh, you could look at your predicted link. It's really pretty cool. And I did mention rain. So rain is a big thing on 60 or anything millimeter wave. So um, you, it's in that link path. Uh, you could use it in order to factor in if you want to look at rain fade. If for further links, the truth is, if it's more than a kilometer, you could expect a, a, if it's a pretty strong uh, storm, you're going to go down on 60. The shorter links, you could burn through it. You got a lot of gain. And, and I think there's also a uh, from the say wireless LAN community, let's say you know the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz only people, um, that 60 only goes like 100 feet or 100 meters, and that's it. And that's not really true. I mean, with the with having a 42 dBi antenna uh, and 14 dBm, you know, you still got some pretty good range. You go through some uh, some of the stuff, if you will, some of that oxygen, for example. Here's yeah, the other slide there is like a continuation at the bottom of the page, further down from the, the two slides ago, uh, showing um, the link predicted uh, throughput. I think that's more, I'd say more accurately and more of like a data rate than a throughput. Okay, now the product line. So the Metrolink One, got, uh, it's like a one gigabit ethernet uh, interface. Uh, there's There's two variants of this. Um, there's the, the 35 centimeter, so it's a little over a foot, you know, it's kind of like pretty much like a, a one foot antenna. Uh, so because it has two radios, it's, it's actually the same antenna for both the, the 60 and the five gigahertz. It's a 42 dBi, two dBi. So even on five, it's pretty high gain antenna. Um, the 19, they're both the same output power, 14 dBm on 60 and t about 23 dBm on five gigahertz. Uh, and then, so the 19 is at uh, 10 to 16 dpi, so a little less distance. You'll see in some of the other slides I'll show you. I'm going to skip through for the sake of time. Uh, so here's the 2.5. The big difference is the throughput capability, the interface, the N base T. It's 2.5 gigabit uh, Ethernet in. Um, so that's the big difference between these two, and also a more powerful processor to handle that higher between these two models, the 2.5 versus the one. There's also the beam forming sector. So this is more of an access point where um, you see the gain is much lower, it's 18 dBi. It is beam forming to help with that. So um, as you know, with 60, your ranges are shorter. So with, with 36 dBi uh, and 42, you, you got a lot of gain there. Um, so if you're doing, um, point to multipoint, you would typically have, let's say, a sector, 120 degree sector, and then your client devices would be the 30 dBi or the 42 dBi product coming back to the sector. This is similar to this one, but it's a it's a lower cost alternative where it's uh, instead of uh, a 2.5 2 gigabit uh, uh, and base T Ethernet and uh, processor. Uh, capable of more throughput. Um, this one's uh, the one gigabit uh, ethernet um, interface. Uh, I would say this is still no slouch either though. Um, and also has a 2.4 and five gigahertz radio in it. So you could actually set those up as, in access point mode, which is kind of neat. There's two variants of this, variants of this, the 2.4, uh, there's a sector and then there's also um, one with RPSMA connectors. So you could run an Omni or something for 2.4. To actually backhaul on 60, fail over on five, but have the five act as an access point until the 60 fails over, and then it could act as kind of like a repeater on five uh, if 60 were to go down, and then 2.4 uh, is always access point. So it's a lot of flexibility there. Okay, now there's the monster. This is the beast. This guy um, has videos in it. So. I mentioned the, the, the 120 degree sector earlier. 
Um, so what if you need more than that? You're going to have three sectors or um, a more simpler and even co more cost-effective solution actually is to go with this. And this is three sectors acting as 360 degrees uh, on the 60 gigahertz. Then there's the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz radios also. So there's actually five total radios in here. Um, so it's kind of like the single sectors. They, they, they are configured and programmed separately. So each 60 gigahertz radio gets its own channel and and you, you set them separately up in, in the GUI. Um, so that's how that works. And then, uh, like I said, five could be set up as failover, which you should do, um, or it could be access and failover. Uh, and then 2.4 is your access. And here's just an overview of the products overall in the slide. And one, it does show a little bit of distance here. I didn't see it on the other slide. So um, I'll show you here that like say up to one kilometer, this is like recommended. Um, we have customers with further lengths than this. Uh, like for example, the, the 42 dBi, the up to six kilometers, there is somebody uh, doing 2.5 kilometers, but they are out in Arizona, more forgiving. Um, and I guess the occasional storm, they just accept that they'll fail over to five. I'll skip through these. Okay, um, just the brackets. Um, uh oh, let's see. Okay, that's good. I just want to make sure it's correct. Okay, so there's two brackets. Uh, there's more of the, the optional uh, precision bracket, and then there's the, the LC. The LR is the more precision bracket. It's more heavy duty, uh, handles more um, or, um, the chance of uh, the antenna getting misaligned or um, affected by, say, wind or things like that, tire. Um, the, uh, it, it's actually more for fine tuning. I think that's, uh, may, maybe more of the takeaway on that one. And then there's the LC precision, which actually, if you, if you follow our products, the, there was another bracket that's been depreciated. The replacement now is the LC. Mentioned earlier, the alignment scope. Um, so that's, there's a slide on that. And then the, uh, link assist. And it's Bluetooth connection. Okay, moving on. Um, also, IgniteNet has layer two managed switches. So I'll go quickly through those. Uh, we got the uh, the ten port. It's eight Ethernet plus two gigabit uplink ports. PoE switch. PoE plus. Um, the twenty four uh, twenty four port switch, and the fiber switch. Here's a screenshot of the switch dashboard. I'll skip through some of this. Okay, another product I think uh, is pretty unique and interesting is the G-Link. So, uh, now you might think it's kind of antiquated. It's, it's, it's kind of like uh, Ethernet over coax, but it's Ethernet over coax where you got a lot of available throughput, like gigabit. So it's gigabit over coax, RG6, RG11, but at a, a lot of throughput capability. So it's pretty neat. And how this thing works, actually, so you can get a master or a client. They're actually, you can mix and match them. Um, you power one up, and you could power the other devices off of coax. So it's power over coax, up to 16 others. And the client can power up the master, the master can quite power up the clients or vice versa, or other clients can power up each other. That's one thing. Uh, there's one customer I know of that has a run of over a thousand feet of RG6 and still getting over 200 megabits. I thought that was pretty impressive. So, uh, so where would this, of course, be used for is like multi-dwelling units, uh, for example, or apartment complexes or things where running cable is difficult and or you could use the existing um rg6 or you know coaxial tv coaxial you know network uh, cabling i should say i'm skipping through some of this for the sake of time It's just to show an example, you get your uh, your connection in, and 
from your, let's say your link, your point to point link, you're coming in and uh, then you're feeding that in to your, to your inside network. All right, next is the mesh link um, switch. So the switch is, is unique in that it's, I think there's two main things to take away with this switch. It's an outdoor switch. It's IP55 rated switch. Uh, also, it supports trill. So alternative option to using, say, like more complicated setting up a more complicated network like a OSPF and everything. Um, one of the problems if you're just doing, let's say, if you want redundancy is if you have a multiple uh, links coming up to the same network is you'll you'll trigger spanning tree protocol to cut one side of the link. So Trill is a, a future revision of SCP, spanning tree protocol, but it's smarter. It, it, it doesn't kill the other side of the redundant link. It actually maintains it and adds it additional throughput, but also uh, will be there uh, for, you can still have it as for redundancy as well. So big advantage of Trill. And this switch is, has a trill uh, capability in it. And also it's outdoor rated. So it's a 2.5 gigabit ethernet in PoE and also the, out, the other four are PoE out. Here's the dashboard for the trill, I mean the, um, the mesh link switch. Okay, and that concludes the, uh, the slide deck there. I think we should open it up to questions. Chad, you there? Or Ken? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Uh huh. Great. Okay. Um, thank you, Dan. That was a great presentation. Appreciate that. We have a few questions. Uh, let me pull them up real quick here. Um, was when when will Trill be available? I've heard it's on upcoming firmware. Hmm. Oh, I think I think you're talking about the um, probably for the Omni or on the um, not on, obviously on that switch, but uh, I, I I'll check. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> hey, I've heard about um, it too. Dan, hey, Dan, this yeah. is Tony. Um, yeah. So yeah, the, you know what the trill feature that? that the trill feature that we're adding to the Metrolink products um, was supposed to be in the beta firmware four point two point one that we're releasing by the eleventh of November. Um, but it didn't make it into that firmware. Um, we wanted to make sure that this firmware got out. So it'll be in 4.2.2 .2 that releases sometime towards the end of November. Um, but yeah, that feature is definitely coming. So not in the next firmware update, but the one after that for sure. Um, and just a quick note, um, the beta firmware for Metrolink products, that's the Omni, the ML1 series, and the ML2.5 series, that should drop as a formal public re release around November 11th. That's our target plan right now. That's the firmware version that Dan was talking a little bit about where we're adding a bunch of features and, and on top of just fixing general stability. So we're adding the ability to do half channels. So instead of two gigahertz channels, you're gonna get, you're gonna get eight one gigahertz channels. So you'll get channel one, channel 1.5, all the way up to channel 4.5. So it'll increase the channel count. Um, obviously lowering the throughput a little bit on the half channels, but giving you the ability to get more channels, say out of an Omni, so you can connect more clients that way. It also will raise the client count on any of the 120 degree sectors to 16 clients from 12. So any of the 120 degree sector panel antenna radios will be able to support 16 clients. And it also fixes, I think, some issue that a lot of customers have been wondering about, which is uh, the uh, VLAN tagging pass through over the, uh, the layer two bridges, the Metrolink bridges. So, so everyone keep an eye out for that firmware update. It's uh, 2.4.1 and, and it comes out sometime around November 11th. And then the Trill feature adding to the next firmware that comes out towards the end of November. Sorry, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I actually want to expand on what you're saying, Tony, on that firmware, because it excites me as a, a radio nerd, right? That channel 4.5 is just high enough that gets just outside the oxygen absorption. So a channel four has about 9 dB of, of, of oxygen absorption per kilometer, where channel 4.5 is only one. 
there's an 8 dB on, you know, this is theoretical, I mean, it's close, with about 8, not theoretical, but I'm saying this is approximate is a better word of saying it, about an 8 dB improvement by moving it up just that half channel up. On top of that, if you want to narrow the RF channel from 2 gigahertz wide down to 1 gigahertz wide, which is still a ridiculous amount of throughput, right, because the channel is so wide still, you get a 3 dB roughly. Uh, improvement there. So if you're running half channel and channel 4.5, there's up to about an 11 dB improvement in your, in your link. It's, it's big. Okay, next question is, um, the two and, a, two and a half uh, gig AP panel shows 18 dB and the Omni shows 17, so the panel is a bit stronger. True? I looked into that. I think it's a typo. I think it's supposed to be 18 also. It's, I think it's the same sector. It's just that it's a typo because I found somewhere else. Uh, it's also 18 on the uh, on the. <laughs> so. Uh, next question goes back to uh, Trill. Uh, do you uh, do your access points uh, in the point to point do Trill? Uh, no, I think Tony was alluding to that. Tony, was that maybe you could comment on that? Was that just on the Omni, or was that on all the MetroLink? It'll be on all the Metrolink radios when the firmware is released um, with that Trill support. So ML1s, ML2.5s, um, ML2.5 BF18 panel, and 10 gig on me. Okay, uh, next question is, which unit would be typically used as a CPE as opposed to an AP? Okay, so the, well, the, let me see if I can go back to the slides here. Maybe I could go quickly, hopefully, <laughs> uh, without messing things up too much. Okay, here we go. Any of these could be both a client or a, what we call a master or a client. So if you're doing point to point, let's say the 35, you want maximum distance, you get both the highly directional and you know radios to go point to point. But typically, I mean, the sectors are pretty much going to be access points. The higher gain devices that you see here are uh, going to be uh, more often not a access point, but like a client, more, more so. But you could use them for both. It just depends on the application, how far your links need to be. So that's kind of it. So they, they, either one could be either or. They, they, you go into the GUI, you could set them as master or client. Okay. Uh, next question is which unit? Uh, I'm sorry, I read that one. The um, do your point-to-point -point access points do LACP? I'm not sure, Tony. Do you uh, I believe they do not right now, but we'll have to check and confirm on that and get back to you. Okay. And uh, next question is Omni meshing from AP to AP. I guess is that uh, is that doable? I I don't think it is. No, there's no meshing capability um, from Omni to Omni. There's a way to set an Omni up so that one panel, 120 degree sector panel in one of them, will talk to the other directly, but it, it requires changing the panel to point to point. But it has no mesh capabilities. It's not sensing other Omnis around it or offloading traffic or anything like that. Not not yet. Um, definitely something we're looking at doing, but it's not implemented right now. Okay, uh, I just had one more come in here. Let me check it out here. It says, um, uh, it's just a one word question. It says, Terragraph. <laughs> yeah, so, so Terragraph, for those that don't know, is a Facebook, uh, Facebook initiative um, that's around millimeter wave and has uh, 60 gigahertz applications um, where, where Facebook is trying to create more of a, a standardization of the frequencies, uh, you know, 60 gigahertz, the millimeter wave stuff, some interoperability um, and meshing capabilities. So, so what we can say about Teragraph right now is that we're working towards our next generation version of products, you know, Metrolink products, that will be Teragraph compliant or Teragraph uh, certified. Um, and Hopefully, you'll see something by, you know, Q1, probably closer to mid Q2 of next year as far as, like, engineering samples and things that people could start testing and playing with. But um, 
right now, yeah, we're definitely working towards a uh, Terragraph compliant product. Okay, last question. Is a RADIUS management login on the roadmap? Uh, Tony, you know, uh, that's a great thing question. about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the answer is I'm not sure. We would have to find out. Ken, if you can get the names of the folks with these questions um, sure. so we can get back to them, that would be great. But um, offhand, I'm yeah. not sure. All righty. Well, that concludes the questions we have for right now. All right. Great. great. Everybody, thank you for. Uh, Thank you for coming and uh, for being a part of the webinar. If there were any other questions um, that we weren't able to get to, we will uh, make sure to get back to those to you offline individually. And um, again, thank you for spending some time with us this afternoon. Have a great day.